In this video we're going to look at heat capacity, the amount of energy it takes to heat a substance up. And we're also going to look at heat and temperature and why they're not quite the same thing. So when we supply an amount of heat Q to a substance, the temperature change that we'll get delta T depends on how much stuff we've got. After all, it takes more energy to heat up 100 grams of water to boiling than it takes to heat up 20 grams of water to boiling. And it also depends on the substance that we're heating up. If we're boiling up water in a saucepan, the temperature rise for the aluminium saucepan is generally greater than that for the water. So the heat Q and the temperature change delta T are proportional to one another. The more heat we put in, the higher temperature change we'll get. But that constant proportionality isn't always the same. It depends on both the amount of substance we've got and the identity of the substance that we're heating. So we've got an amount in grams, then we're talking about the specific heat capacity. In this case, the heat Q is equal to the mass in grams multiplied by the specific heat capacity in joules per gram per Kelvin multiplied by the temperature change delta T. Specific heat capacity per gram, lowercase c. But if we've got the amount in moles, then we're talking about the molar heat capacity. And now it's the number of moles multiplied by the molar heat capacity multiplied by the temperature change, delta T, that will give us the heat. Molar heat capacity per mole. So let's do an example. Let's heat up an aluminium saucepan of 200 grams containing 150 grams of water from room temperature, 20 degrees, up to boiling, up to 100 degrees C. Well, we've been given the masses, we've been given grams of aluminium and water, so we're going to Google the specific heat capacities. So for solid aluminium, that's 0.9 joules per gram per Kelvin. What does that mean? It means that it takes 0.9 joules to heat up one gram of aluminium metal by one Kelvin. The speci specific heat capacity of water, 4.184 joules per gram per Kelvin. So it takes 4.184 joules to heat up every gram of water by Kelvin. So the heat capacity of water is much bigger, meaning it takes more energy to heat up the same amount of water by the same temperature than it does aluminium. So the first job, let's work out the temperature difference. 20 degrees C, 293 Kelvin. 100 degrees C, 373 Kelvin. So the temperature difference is 80 Kelvin. What well, do we need to do that? The temperature difference in degrees C is 100 minus 20, is also 80 degrees. 80 degrees C as a temperature difference in centigrade is the same as the temperature difference in Kelvin. Adding 273 to both and then taking the difference between them is the same as not doing anything. So a shortcut. Temperature difference in Kelvin is always the same as temperature difference in degrees C. So we've got our temperature difference. We need to add heat that will heat up both the pan and the water. So we need to do two separate calculations. We need to work out the heat required to heat up the aluminium and the heat required to heat up the water. So let's do the aluminium first. We've got 200 grams of aluminium. Its specific heat capacity is 0.9 joules per gram per Kelvin. And we need to heat it up by 80 Kelvin. Multiply the three things, we get 14,400 joules. Let's make sure we've used the right heat capacity. If we've used the right heat capacity, the unit should all work out. We've got grams, and we've got grams to the minus 1. They cancel. We've got kelvins, and we've got kelvins to the minus 1, and they cancel. All we're left over with is joules. Joule is the correct unit for energy, for heat. So let's do the same thing for the water. The mass of the water multiplied by its specific heat capacity multiplied by the temperature change. 150 grams multiplied by 4.184 joules per gram per Kelvin. 80 Kelvin rise gives us 50,200 joules. Lastly, add the two things together and we get 64,000 joules. Okay, so how is this used on a large scale? Well, if we want to determine the energy content of a fuel or perhaps a food, then we'd use a big device called a bomb calorimeter. This is a large amount of water with the reaction going on at the center. The energy coming out of the reaction heats up the water. It's very well insulated from the rest of the universe, and so there's mu not much, if any, heat lost or gain from the outside world. So all of the energy from the reaction heats up the water, and the temperature rise we get enables us to work out the, e the energy change, the heat change. Now this is a sealed device. It's at constant volume. So a bomb calorimeter 
by measuring the temperature change allows us to work out the heat change and that heat change is the internal energy change for the reaction. On a smaller scale in a lab we might use a less sophisticated device like a coffee cup calor calorimeter. This is a styrofoam cup which is reasonably well insulated and again it contains water and the reaction at the centre heats up that water and the temperature rise we get can again give us the heat change for the reaction. Now this is working at constant pressure, it's working at atmospheric pressure and so the, the energy change, the heat change that we measure or work out from a coffee cup calorimeter experiment is giving us the enthalpy change of the reaction. Okay so one last calculation, let's do one using the bomb calorimeter. A manufacturer claims that their dessert has fewer than 50 kilojoules per serving and you're asked to investigate. So you burn a, one serving in a bomb calorimeter and you get a temperature increase of 4.94 degrees. Is the claim justified? Well we're given the heat capacity of the bomb calorimeter it's 8.15 kilojoules per kelvin. But look that's not a specific heat capacity, there's no per gram and that's not a molar heat capacity, there's no per mole. This is the heat capacity of the whole instrument. The bomb calorimeter is made up of water and wires and thermometers. There's a lot of different components with different masses and different heat capacities. The heat capacity of the whole thing, taking into account the mass of each item and the heat capacity of each item, taken together gives us a heat capacity overall of 8.15 kilojoules per kelvin. Now this actually makes our calculation easier. We just multiply that by our temperature increase of 4.94, 8.15 kilojoules per kelvin, multiplied by 4.94 Kelvin gives us 40.3 kilojoules. We can again make sure that we've done the right thing by looking at the units. We've got Kelvin and Kelvin to the minus 1 which cancel which means that the unit of our answer, the unit of heat is given in kilojoules which is an entirely appropriate unit. Well 40.3 is left in 50 kilojoules and so the claim is upheld. <laughs>